What's up, YouTube? Hello, everyone. It is Sunday, April the 29th of 2018. It's 8 o'clock in the evening. Got the sunshine in my eyes. I like a little natural sunlight. It makes it a little easier to do this. I enjoy this time of year because the sun doesn't go down until 9 o'clock in the evening. And I am a okay with that. I'm going to get everything squared away here on my end. And then begin talking to each of you. All right, here we go, here we go, here we go. What's going on? Brew Knight caught you in the chat hanging out early. David, how are you? Good, sir. CD Andrews. Hey, oh, what's going on? Alfred, how are you, sir? Mr. Carlson. Hey, buddy. Michael Moore. That's right. That's right. Everlasting daylight, it feels like. You know, when peak summer's here, it'll be like 9, 10 at night. Uh, and you'll still have just a glimmer of sunlight left out. And that's kind of the interesting thing um, about Knoxville and the everlasting daylight. It's like we're in Alaska. How about them apples? I completely made that up. Let's get back to the chat here. Ray, my man Ray is here. Ray, the green doctor of Hawaii. Connor Ward, what's going on? I was just watching your video of the side-by-side uh, -side comparison between your two Toro real mowers. Looks like they're clocking in at 0.7 on the little high to cut there. John Ware, Ronald Parrish. How are you, Miss Parrish? John Ware checking in with a two-week-old baby girl. Congratulations, sir. I believe you told me that was number two. I hope you enjoy it. I hope she sleeps through the night, and uh, and that all is fair and world, uh, fair and happy in your world. That is for sure. Mr. Thompson, how are you, sir? Phil Sullivan, what's up, my man? Look at this. CD Andrew felt great throwing out the molasses, in part because of the smell. I'll give you that. Uh, it is deceiving. Your lawn will smell edible. I would highly advise you not to eat the grass in your yard. You could. It's probably not going to make you sick, but don't do it. Turf nerd, you do need to go home soon. Hey, David, I had a really good time hanging out with you yesterday, even though we did not really hang out. <laughs> Glenn Stevens got more snow up in the New York. Man, I hate that for you, dude. I absolutely hate that. Uh, I can't even fathom what it'd be like to, to get, get snow right now. My wife told me she'd be sneaky when she came in here, and then all of a sudden she dropped my guitar. <laughs> Everybody's piling in now. Uh, Shane Brady, how are you, sir? Did you catch your day job? Look at that. Catching the grass better. What's going on? Paul, how are you, sir? Paul's over there in North Carolina doing it big. Having some uh, mystery yellow spots show up in the in the yard. Ray, my kids are not in bed. Typically they are in bed now, but uh I'm gonna I'm gonna let them go till the sun goes down because my son tends to complain if he's still awake and the sun is up. Uh, he just doesn't quite understand how that all works. Um yeah, but it is what it is. It is what it is. Felix, how are you, sir? Hey, I appreciate you tuning in. Um, so kind of an interesting thing that is going on, at least here in this area, that I thought I'd talk a little bit about. Uh, I've been getting so many people contact me about their fescues having a disease, and everybody thinks, oh, my goodness, is this brown patch? It's been so cold outside. Why do I have all this brown patch? What's up, Jay? And the fact of the matter is, is that no, it's not brown patch. Typically, you're going to see the development of brown patch when you have six days consecutive temperatures over 80 degrees. And that may even bleed into 82, 83. 
and you have nighttime temperatures 55 plus closer to 60 degrees. So six consecutive days of 80 plus and 60 plus at night is kind of the general rule of thumb on brown patch development. Uh, humidity is going to play a part in that, but typically if you're in that in that temperature range, you're in that area for brown patch development. That's rhizoctonia. However, what you're seeing happen now is you know, nights at 40 degrees, daytimes in the mid 70s. <clears throat> what is it? Well, you have to remember we went through a period of three pretty much all day rain events and then followed by a day of clouds and then a day of sun. So out of a seven day period, we really only had two days of actual sunshine. And for the rest of the time, it was cool. So the problem is, is that it's led to the development of a disease called Helminthosporium. Helminthosporium is a leaf spot disease. Um, it is also referred to as uh, melting out. It has very similar control structures that brown patch would have. So your strobilurin fungicides would act as a curative. Um, DMIs would act as a curative. And, uh, and so anyway, this is the public service announcement about if you're beginning to see something that looks like a yellowing disease issue in fescue, it's probably Helminthosporium. Uh, from a cultural perspective, that may point to the fact that you're a little deficient in potassium. Um, you had, well, you don't know this, but um, I'm in the middle of building out my video for the cool season program um, about how to, how to manka zeb. You were right, Ray. My goodness. I was going to say, go ahead and spray manka zeb, but I know that that's not a good thing to do. Uh, anyway, the, um, one of the, uh, I'm, I'm, so I'm, I'm putting together how to build a cool season lawn program. And again, this is, you know, applied science theory, uh, type, type structure. Um, but it's talking about potassium usage in plants. And so, I was following a couple different studies that go from seed production to sod production on turf type tall fescue and the rate of potassium consumption. And so, typically, starting in March, you have this potassium consumption, I mean, uh, this nitrogen consumption that shoots up, you know, mid, mid February into, uh, into March, you know, your nitrogen really kicks up. Well, just after that, right before nitrogen is beginning to peak, your potassium actually goes through the same thing. And it's a much sharper accelerated usage bell curve. It's not, it's not a traditional bell curve. I mean, it, it really rockets just straight up. And that starts sometime in the April time frame. And it goes from zero to 100 really fast. So the problem is, is a lot of times, you know, guys may be you know, going out with just a nitrogen app in, in the in the spring, and you know they're catching their potassium on the back end. Well, on the you know if, when you're applying your potassium in in late season, um, you know that may be used up really quickly through the whole establishment period. Therefore, you're a little bit lean on K going into the spring, and so when that immediate need for potassium usage just comes, you know, super hardcore flowing into the plant, coupled with cool weather, coupled with a lack of sunlight, then all of a sudden you may be dealing with something um, like Helminthosporium. So anyway, that's, that's my public service announcement for Helminthosporium. Uh, that's probably what you're seeing in fescues right now. Mike, Mike you aren't kidding, man. It hadn't been sunny and 80 since february which is ridiculous in february it was sunny and 80 since then it was 38 degrees this morning here i mean that's that's brutal i tried to go fishing and it was too cold to go fishing i still caught three fish and they were tiny and i was really embarrassed um rolling headway on tuesday cd andrews you're not going to go wrong with headway it is um you know that's a that's a good two point uh two mode of action um, hot hit on the helmet this morning. I think I think that's going to be a good a good choice there. Telly Coleman, how are you, sir? 
Steve, Steve applied Azoxy today. Steve, were you going after Hillman Thesporium? Um, I'm curious how, how many people are out there seeing it. I'm seeing it just a little bit here in Knoxville. I mean, it's a little spot here and there, uh, but it seems like everybody in North Carolina, that's where I'm getting most of the feedback on people um, having this issue. Uh, Ray running. Is that what the 13045? Is that potassium nitrate? What is that, Ray? I'm not I'm not familiar with a, a 13045, unless that's just a, a blend you're out there running. Uh, I know you're a foliar feeder, so you may be you may be doing that foliarly too. Uh CD Andrews Air 8 probably wouldn't be a bad choice. You know, that is a potassium source. It's a 005, so it's not a hop wallop of potassium, but that would be a good start. Potassium nitrate. There you go. $64,000 question, is it dithiopyr or dithiopyr? That's a great question, Sid Barrett. Um, I don't know. I have no idea. I say dithiopyr. Uh, I hear lots of people say dithiopyr. Uh, most chemical reps I hear say dithiopyr. Um, I don't know why I say dithiopyr, but I do, and I'm not changing it. I'm not going to change it. I'm set in my ways. I'm an old, angry, ornery man. Uh, what are you doing on your lawns for it? Uh, Alan, I'm not doing anything on my lawns for it because, to be honest, I'm lucky that I do not have any of it in my lawns. Um, if I had it in my lawns, I'd be doing two things. Um, one, I would... Turf nerd says thigh. Um I would run a high rate of potassium. Uh, like, you know, right now I'm, I'm slamming yards with potassium, uh, with, with potassium sulfate. So that could be one of the contributing factors to that. And I've, I've made it through uh, all my fescues on round two. So they've all gotten a very high rate of potassium. Um, so I would start with that and and then pay attention to your weather. So like I know this this next week that we have coming up, we're going to be getting up to 80 degrees, maybe a little higher than 80 degrees. Um, and that alone may help clear up your leaf spot. Uh, warmer weather, a little bit drier weather. Um, so, you know, pay attention to your weather. Maybe do a, a, a supplementation of a high rate of potassium. Um, and then, you know, worst case scenario, if it looks like it's going to continue to be rain or cloudy in your future, then, you know, you may want to go the fungicide route. Um, so there you go. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, Sid. I'm doing the best I can, man. I'm doing the best I can. Look at this death and diet. We <laughs> and thighs. We got them all over the place. Matt Davis. That's right. The DDT. Um, or DTT, dwarf type tall fescue. Um, so I was doing a little bit of reading in this, and it was still looking like it was a one to one and a half inch cut on um, on the DTT. Um, it is not something I see here where I am. Um, and I would say that has to do a little bit with the temperature restrictions on it. Uh, but in terms of for home lawn use, I think I think that's a, a great idea. I saw there was also a double a double dwarf. I think someone was referring um, the double dwarf to me, and I don't know why. It seems to be more of a West Coast thing. Um, at least the people that were recommending it to me were West Coast people, so I don't know if it doesn't do particularly well. Uh, with humidity or I, I don't know. I don't know what that deal is. I just, to be honest, last week was really the first time I'd had anybody really getting into uh, the dwarf type tall fescue. So I don't know. Uh, CD, you're doing a half ounce of PPZ. So that would be, uh, what is that? Twenty-two ounces to the acre, is that right? Yeah, and uh, and point two of stroby. So what would that be? Is that sixteen? Is that sixteen ounces to the acre of stroby? Um, pardon my math. I'm trying to do that off the top of my head. Um, 
it may be a, a little less than, than – no, that would be 16. That's got to be 16, something like that. I don't know. Uh, but, yeah, I would say I would say that would be a good – a good one. A good one. Um, per thousand. I, yeah, I, to be honest, I don't know what the per thousand rates are on PPZ or Strawberry. To be honest, I, I've, I've run them at acre rates for so long that I don't I don't know what that is. Um, look at Rob Hawkins here. Just got back from blowing Rock Boone celebrating our 17th wedding anniversary. Nothing green or blooming up there yet. Congratulations, Rob Hawkins. Uh, that is a long time. Uh, I hope my wife and I make it 17 years. She may not, but I <laughs> hope so. Uh, Bean from North Georgia. What's up, man? New house. New Bermuda sod laid with one and a half, two inch gaps. Scared to put down chemicals, but have a lot of ryegrass and spring weeds coming through the spaces. Suggestions. Uh, how long has the sod been laid? Um, Bean, if you are to the point where you can uh, pull on the Bermuda grass and not pull anything up, uh, where you are completely rooted in, then by all means, you can spray it. Uh, if you're in North Georgia, I would say you're on the tail end of your tra transition. If you're not through transition, probably what I would do is get it cut extremely, extremely low, as low as you can without digging into the dirt, um, and encourage it to green up as quickly as possible. And then at that point, go ahead and get your herbicide down once you've completely greened up. Being newer side, you may not want to hammer it until it's through transition, uh, so maybe do all your steps possible to, to accelerate that, that movement through transition and then get down your, your herbicides. Uh, but if you're dealing with ryegrass and spring weeds coming through the spaces, I mean, it, it, that's, it's pretty, pretty simple to kill. Um, you know, I would be looking at an application of something like Celsius or Tribute Total or Celsius and Revolver or Monument. All of those are very broad spectrum in terms of the the amount of weeds that are controlled. Um, so that would take care of your grassy and uh, uh, a, a decent host of broadleaf weeds. Um, if you're concerned about sedges potentially becoming an issue, you know, I would steer you more towards the monument. Uh, if you're not concerned with sedges, then I would steer you more towards the tribute total. Party Girl says, should I fertilize in the later spring or now to keep Dollar Spot at bay? I want to put a synthetic one, then Milo during summer months. I'm in Pittsburgh, pa. Um, it's a great question. So if you're concerned with Dollar Spot, um, I would go ahead and get that down now because you're probably – within a few weeks away of, of dollar spot developing. And I wouldn't worry so much about just nuking it with nitrogen, uh, but I would run maybe a one-to-one -one or a one-to-two ratio of nitrogen to potassium and go ahead and get those potassium levels up in anticipation of dollar spot season. Um so I like your idea of using synthetics and malorganite during summer months. Nothing wrong there. That's a that's a good way to, you know, maximize your carbon uh, buildup in the soil, and you know, continue to push you know your your controllable, predictable results through synthetics. I'm I'm good with that. I think that's a good idea. Um, but again, with the dollar spot, you know. Go ahead and get your K down now at the same rate you would get down your N or even higher than you would get down your N. So a one-to-one -one or a one-to-two ratio of N to K. Just got my bio stick stem kit from Pete at GCI. Horrible snow mold here in Minnesota. Applied Air 8 and RGS per label. Will this help emerge my Kentucky bluegrass to the snow mold patches quicker? I don't know, Josh Carlson. I do not use... I do not have really any Kentucky bluegrass to play with, uh, but from a scientific perspective, I would say yes. So Air 8 is going to um, 
Air 8 is going to supply a potassium source, and it'll come in the form of potassium hydroxide. So you're going to have that reaction taking place in the soil. Plus, you're going to have the humic and kelp combination take place, which you know ultimately is going to provide a host of cytokinins, auxins, gibberellins, uh, growth hormones that will help um, decrease the amount of senescence in the, the Kentucky bluegrass. That's the old age and keep it young and thriving and, and regenerative. So uh, all science points to, yes, that would help that recover quicker. And that's what I got. Celsius for new side. There he goes. There he goes. Uh, Ronald Parrish, if low with phosphorus in a lawn, Kentucky bluegrass, how would I keep it in the optimal range all year long? Uh, you supplement with phosphorus. Um, here's the thing. Okay, so Kentucky bluegrass is not going to be a giant phosphorus consumer. Um, so, you know, really, you may only need to make one or possibly two apps of FOSS, uh, you know, so maybe like a pound, maybe a pound and a half per thousand square feet of actual available FOSS to keep that in optimal ranges all year long. Um, FOSS is one of those things that, um, you know, in, in a period where you're you're seeding, you know, say you're having to do a lot of, of rebuild work with your, with your seeding, then yeah, you may eat up a lot more FOSS. Um, but if you're not doing seed and you're just maintaining it, you wouldn't need to worry as much with it. Rye Master, hey Matt Ryan from New Linux, Illinois. Whoa, no idea where that is. That sounds sounds like another world away. Uh, do the bio products next need to be watered in? Uh, to an extent, yes, Rye Master. Always, anytime you're applying something like that. Uh, anytime you're applying anything to the line, uh, at some point it needs to be watered in. And I'll tell you why. Because there's going to be a foliar component that comes with the next line of products. So whether it's a micronutrient, um, you know, all of that is going to, to happen foliarly. Or it's a, uh, it's a combination between, you know, a humic fulvic and uh, a, a a nitrogen source or you know, a, mac a macronutrient source, there's going to be a foliar uptake that occurs with that. So um, where foliar uptake, the thing that needs to be said about that is that there has to be plenty of soil moisture available in order for foliar uptake to happen efficiently. So yes, it does need to be watered in, even if it is, you know, you're, you're banking on the foliar uptake. Uh, you still need to water it because what doesn't get taken in foliarly ultimately does get taken up by the root. So it's coming up in two different ways there. Uh, so yes, always need to make sure that um, any product like that is uh, is watered in. Any, any, any fertilizer or biostimulant, I would highly recommend watering in. Oh man, look at this. 12 weeks, man. Uh, what, what was 12 weeks ago? January? February time frame? Yeah, February. Um, some squares are dead. 70% green. Yeah, man, I would get that cut. If, if, if you've already got squares that are dead and 70% green, light that bad boy up with, with Celsius and be done with it. Um, that way you know what's dead, you know what's not dead, and, and man, just run with it. Hey, Matt, you've done core aerations in spring and put down pre-emergent with minimal weed breakthrough. Did you put down pre-emergent first, then core aerate, or vice versa, or does it matter? Uh, Brian, I put down pre-emergent first, then core aerate. Uh, again, that goes against the system. I've never really had just a tr tremendous amount of breakthrough with it. Um, typically, what you would want to do, uh, and there is a little bit of science on that, um, is that you would want to aerate and then put down your pre because the aeration does disturb the soil surface. Um, so I, you know, really it's, it's up to you, you know, to, um, to, uh, you know, play with experiment and, and see what happens. But I, I don't think in a homeowner setting, you're going to see that much of a tremendous difference uh, between pre-emerging before or after aeration. 
Hey, see, long hair guy. What's going on, my man? How are you, sir? Uh, Mr. Staker here says, uh, any other suggestions for controlling Dallas grass in St. Augustine? I've been pulling it by hand and spraying it with glyphosate. Both aren't great. Uh, Staker for Dallas grass, you're going to have to time fall application with Celsius. I believe that's going to be three applications of Celsius. You're not going to have the revolver component in that because revolver is going to be very, very hard on St. Augustine. Um, but you should be able to get it pretty well controlled uh, with Celsius doing fall applications. Um, I'm assuming you're, I'm assuming you're in, in Florida. I don't know if you are or not. Uh, I would, I would begin those applications probably, um, you well into November or December, even if you're in Florida. Um, I would like it better if you lived in an area where it goes completely dormant, it would be easier to time. I have hard red clay. Do you think humic acid would be the best thing to use to break it down? What's the difference between humic acid and air eight HD movie source? This is a good question. Uh, hard red clay. Yes. Humic acid is probably the best thing to use to break it down. Um, the difference between humic acid and air eight is this. Um, it comes into the production of it. So humic acid is, are the organic acids that are extracted from lunardite shale or peat bogs or compost. And it's done so, the, the, the organic acid component of that becomes soluble uh, in a very, very high pH solution. So they extract those acids um, out of your source material at a very high pH. And then as they bring down the pH back to a usable form, they filter off all the, uh, all the solids that form and, and settle. Um, air eight is captured, is, is bottled basically before all the humic acid is brought back down in pH. So it has all this unreacted potassium hydroxide still left in it. And by applying it, you're getting a mix of organic acids, potassium hydroxide applied to the soil to create a reaction in the humus layer of the soil to drag all those goodies in it and pull it through um, and create these microfissures that's ultimately creating more soil surface area uh, to allow, you know, basically in a quote unquote aeration effect. Uh, do you have any experience with Cytogro biostimulant? Thoughts on cost? About 200 per gallon versus plant hardening characteristics. Drew, yeah, so Cytogro is going to be the high cytokinin content type deal. Um, I have used it, and I used it on Bermuda grass. To me, it was not worth the money. Uh, I had much more result out of just a kelp source. Uh, so instead of going with a name brand like a Cytogrow, I highly recommend you find a good kelp source and run that. I think uh, I think you'd be much, much happier with it. It's going to save you a lot of money too. Kelp is not cheap, uh, but it's cheaper than $200 a gallon. And uh, you'll get you'll get a bigger bang for your buck. You get a bigger color response from it. Cytogrow did not give me a traditional color response that I expected. Kelp does. What's an acceptable method for applying RGS to a 6,000 square foot lawn? Pump sprayer, hose in sprayer. Brandon, I, I don't know, man. I honestly don't. I don't, um, you know, I, I spray everything low volume. Uh, so I don't, I don't, I don't know. I would check with who, whoever you bought it from. Um, typically they're going to have some sort of, um, some sort of way, you know, for you to do that. Like I think Pete sells a brand of, uh, of, uh, pumpless sprayers to use, um, you know, a hose in sprayer is not a bad idea. Uh, actually I really like the idea of a hose in sprayer because you can, you can run it at such high volume. So, uh, now that I'm th thinking about that out loud, yeah, go with the hose in sprayer. There you go. Uh, so that's why you have dead square, which people would stop doing things to warm season in the winter. <laughs> that's funny. 
Uh, got a bunch of orchard grass in my fescue lawn. Do I got to blow holes in the lawn? Other options. Yes, Felix, you got to blow holes in the lawns. Uh, I will tell you that the one thing I used that did work decently on it uh, was Velocity. Um, but Velocity is no longer labeled for residential. So you got to blow holes in it as far as I know. How do I figure out how much organic material is in the Green County products to use in conjunction with Scream and Green to hit the optimal numbers? Uh, Jason Grubb, okay, <laughs> it's funny you should say this. Here, here's the deal. Okay, so that study is based on organic matter, correct? So Scream and Green purely ran that test, you know, comparing. Um, to to come up with that with that ten pounds of of organic matter uh, will you know per thousand square feet or whatever will reduce your synthetic end usage by twenty five percent I think was the the study they they launched okay so in in mind with that here is how I would reverse engineer that. 10 pounds of organic matter coming from biosolids. Biosolids are going to be about 30% carbon. So you're looking at three pounds of actual carbon that you need to get down per thousand square feet um, to mimic everything you see in that trial with Screaming Green. So however, however much carbon that is, that may be like, I don't know, six gallons um, of humic. It may be even more than that. It may be eight gallons of humic. Um, I don't know. Uh, but I would say, oh, man, I, I, I would just guess somewhere in, in the in the six to 12 gallons per acre range is going to be about there. Because you got to think, you got to, you know, how many pounds of actual carbon can they fit? Now, humic acid is going to be upwards of like 80% carbon. So it's a very carbon rich uh, material. Um, so, you know, if you've got like a 6% a solution of humic acid and 80% of that is car, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know. I need to sit down with a, with a pen and a paper and think that out. But, I would say somewhere in that six to 12 gallons per acre range. Uh, let's see here. Let me, let me get caught up on all this here. What is a loam for a soil in a lawn? Uh, a loam is a soil structure, uh, Ronald. Um, it's just a, it's, it's a, it's a name for the composition of your soil. So you can have loamy soil, you can have sandy loam, you can have clay loam, you can have sandy clay. Um, it's just a, uh, it's a label. Turf Taylor Lawn Care, what's going on, man? Hey, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Impl implemented, my, can't wait to see the results. Yeah, man. It's, uh, it's, you know, as, as you use more and more of it, you'll, you'll begin to learn the nuances of it. And, uh, kind of the beautiful thing is that you can't really go wrong using it. So it's a, it's a win, win situation there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. You know, I, I use it on Bermuda grass during a big grow in project I did. And, uh, it, it was, oh, it was okay. And I'll leave it at that. It was okay. Tony Tillman just took on a new customer mid Atlantic region. Uh, I'm using the green County fertilizer products. What would you recommend as the first and second apps to get the best response without overdriving top growth? Um, man, man I, I don't know, Tony. Okay. So it depends on the, the timing between your first and second application. I mean, there's, there's, there's a thousand ways to do that. I mean, really just so many different ways to approach that. So for your first round, um, you know, you can go out with, uh, you know, we'll say like a quarter pound of in and, you know, like a, a two gallon per acre or three gallon per acre rate of, um, of RGS. Um, 
I'd say that's going to give you a pretty good color response without without driving a ton of top growth. Uh, you may have to go with more in. That may only give you about a four week color color response. So you may have to take that up to, you know, we'll say a half pound. And, and really, Tony, the other thing too is that when you're dealing with this time of year, man, like you can't get away from it. It doesn't matter if you put nothing on that yard; it is going to grow, you know, two two and a half inches a week. That's just that's the nature of it right now. Uh, so you know, minimize your in inputs, uh, maximize your your micronutrient. You know, maybe do your micronutrient supplementation, but you got to get down some in just to strengthen it up. Um, and then your second application, you know, then you can shift that more towards uh, a potassium for, but you're still going to have to supplement with in. So those first two rounds, I'd say get out a pound of in maximum between the two round, two rounds. You may want to take that to three quarters of a pound, maybe even a half pound. Uh, maximize your potassium and, you know, put down a good balance rate of micronutrients and, uh, and use, you know, RGS as a, uh, as a root driver to help, you know, max out that, that color. Whew. How about that? Uh, Glenn Stevens used Infix thoughts. Yes, I've used lots of Infix. Okay. So the whole reason I started using Humic acid in general was to stop using Infix. And the reason why is that, hey baby, is that there, there's one way to look at humic acid and that's as a, you know, a, a nutrient stabilizer. So Infix is going to inhibit the reaction that urea has with urease. So you're blocking biology. Um, if you can accomplish the same thing, the study was done by Penn State using a humic DG from the Andersons, where they mimicked the exact same color and nitrogen availability and denitrification um, abilities of Infix, your denitrification inhibitor, with humic acid that instead of blocking soil biology, increased soil biology you're you're delivering a carbon source to uh, extend the release and maximize the efficiency of your nitrogen it's all about enhanced efficiency infix is enhanced efficiency so uh, what it comes down to is infix you can sustain or enhance the efficiency of your nitrogen by blocking soil biology or you can use something like humic acid that is going to uh, increase soil biology and ultimately extend your nitrogen release. CD Andrews, have you lost your mind? Are you kidding me, man? My goodness, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really, I cannot thank you enough. That is really kind of you, and I do not, you do not have to do that. Um, I don't know what to say. That blew my mind. Thank you, C.D. Andrews. Thank you. Um, let's talk a little Bermuda. I know that is your love. First round, second round, and what you like when you're trying to push the Bermuda growth. MPK plus micronutrients are king for pushing Bermuda. Simple as that, Mr. Jim. Simple as that. Um, yeah, look at this. You're getting some great recommendations right here great recommendations ammonium sulfate yep there you go that's a good one throwing some iron and that's going to give you a really good color uh <laughs> i'm a it's a meme ammonium sulfate for the win <laughs> that is hilarious that is hilarious um Malorganite is a meme. <laughs> Humic and ammonium M is not that temporary. 30 to 45 day duration in a hot climate. Yep. Yep. Um, Chris Elms. I, can everybody can see that? I didn't know. I didn't know everybody could see that. That was, uh, I did. Uh, I did not expect that. I thought that that was sent privately. I guess not. Uh, but I am ten dollars richer today. How about that, Maples? Colonel Corn, what's up, my man? How are you, sir? 
you, you, you're beginning to get a little miraculous green up in your um, in your deal there, in your in your your struggling Bermuda grass. Hopefully, you've had a little bit of warmer temperatures this week. But I, you, if you were anything like us, you were actually cool and rainy. Last year, with all the rain, I had tons of fungal issues here in Massachusetts. Red thread and leaf spot into July, which is not very common. Been putting down 2502 with bios at one pound per thousand. Uh, I would assume you're putting down the 2502 at one pound of nitrogen per thousand. Um, uh, because, yeah, if you're dealing with, with red thread and leaf spot issues, I would try and put down like a 25025 or a 20020 uh, or a 10020. Uh, get your get your K content up. Um, Got to get your K content up. You know, it, it, especially when you're when you're dealing with things like like leaf spot in particular and uh, and and red thread. Uh, you know, it sounds like you're getting plenty of nitrogen, but that's only half the battle there. So, uh, you know, twenty o twenty, you know, a ten zero twenty, something like that, and you know, get down a pound, pound and a half of of potassium. Be careful with your potassium source because if you're putting down a pound of potassium from potassium chloride. That can get hot really, really quick, really quick. Uh, yep, yep. Uh, I put down the second anthropodiamine at one pound per acre. Since my lawn was thin with the winter kill, is this going to affect the lateral growth of the of the Muda? PGR put down last Friday has slowed vert growth. Um, no, it is not going to affect the lateral growth, Colonel Corn. What it may have happened is affect its ability to tack down. Uh, so while you're running your real mower, you may pull up some long stolons. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of those things, man. You really, you had no choice. You got to do what you got to do, but no, the pro diamond itself will not affect lateral growth. It will affect the roots ability to tack down to the soil. So you may get a little bit of clubbing that takes place. It, in this instance, it would be very important to spoon feed um, and, you know, make sure you're efficiently, uh, you know, feeding that lawn, not surge growth in it and then letting it dip back down. But, you know, frequent light fertilizations, spoon feed that bad boy, spoon feed it. The green doc would, would be the man for this. Uh, and that's like Ray told me, I did not realize that um, it is not prodiamine. It is dimension in sandy soil, I believe he said, or respecting spectacle has a pretty, pretty bad rap for it as well. Yeah, I got quite a lot of leggy growth. Handsome that hasn't tacked down. And, you know, some that hasn't tacked down, Colonel, that's, you know, that's pretty normal. Uh, so I don't want you to think that every time it doesn't tack down that that is because of your um, prodiamine. Uh, it could just be the fact that it's not tacking down. That's why you see these big, long runners that grow on concrete and never do anything but just exist on concrete. <clears throat> What's the best way to apply liquid products to a 20,000 square foot lawn? I don't want to backpack spray it. Can I use a hose in sprayer? Looking at RGS at three ounces per thousand square feet. What's the best way? Uh, Jim Martin, if you've got a 20,000 square foot yard, I'm going to guess you have a riding lawnmower. Uh, or do you have any kind of toys that you ride? So a Razor or a Kubota tractor or anything of the sort because you can easily get one of those North Star ATV in spray systems for 300 bucks at Northern Tool and hook that bad boy up and then calibrate it based on a set speed and uh, and there you go that's probably probably what I would do in fact you can you can take that that ATV sprayer and you know put a really nice boom on it with uh you know, with custom nozzles, you know, you can put your AI nozzles on it and uh, really, really do a good job with it. Um, let's see here. Spoon feeding a uh, quarter pound a week is best. Yeah, something like that, Colonel. 
you you could probably even drop it then from that, you know, especially if you're running like uh, ammonium sulfate, a eh, quarter pound, maybe drop it a little lower, maybe 0.18, something like that. Uh, is there a way to take care of POA on zoysia grass? Yes, sir, there is. Uh, monument, revolver, um, uh, Celsius if it's hot outside. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's lots of ways to, to get rid of it on zoysia grass. Uh, you can run low volume atrazine. I'm drawing a blank on all my self familiarias. Katana, uh, is another one you can use. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of things. There's lots of things you can put on it. Um, let's see here. I just bought a Grayson Clark spreader mate for my 20,000 square foot lawn. It is awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about, Telly. That is cool. That is very cool. Look at this. Does ammonium thiosulfate act in the same way as granular ammonium sulfate fertilizer? My, my neighbor works at an oil refinery and can get me an unlimited supply of it. I don't know. I don't know enough about the thiosulfate compound. Um, I have used potassium thiosulfate. Uh, but I don't know about ammonium thiosulfate. I'm trying to think of even what that chemical composition would be. Um, I don't know. I do not know. Shane Norris, uh, when should we start putting down disease control? Shane, I was talking about earlier today. Uh, it depends on which disease you're dealing with. If you are dealing with a cool season disease like Helminthosporium, uh, then you should put that down now. If you're talking about brown patch, rhizoctonia, that comes in the summertime with turf type tall fescue, you want to pay attention to when you're going to have you know, a full six days of 80 plus degree weather and 60 plus degree weather at night, really 55 plus degree weather at night. So above 80 and during the day and above 55 at night for six consecutive days. Uh, when that looks to be happening uh, within a uh, 14 day window or so, you should begin putting down your disease control. Uh, I don't know, Ronald. I do know, but I can't, honestly, I can't talk about it. <laughs> I, I hate to do that, but I'm, I am, uh, I'm forbidden from talking about it, but, uh, very soon, very soon. Um, Nathan Hubler, I tried some humic 12 through a hose in sprayer and found it worked okay, but I felt like I had some clogging issues. I'm no expert, but I'd be wary of that depending on the equipment you're using. There you go. I, you know, I've, I've never... I've never tried, you know, I've never, I've never used a hose and sprayer, so I don't know. Um, ammonium thiosulfate is different, more sulfur, more acidifying effect. There you go. There you go. Thank you for that, Ray. I did not know. I learned. I'm going to pay more attention to that, that chemical composition of uh, ammonium thiosulfate. Break that down. Put it into my head. Jim Martin, four nozzles, 815, drops into a Lesco eight-pound broadcast spreader. Yeah, that's right. Check out Connor Ward's sprayer. That's how to get it done. Who was it? It was Jim Martin with the 20,000-square-foot yard. Connor Ward has a 20,000-square-foot yard, and it is on fire. Check that out. Hey, look, look at that. He did not – hey, every, everybody be nice to Connor Ward. Everybody be nice to Connor Ward. What is this disease called, Sean? Sean? Should say again, not Sean. What is... The, what, are, what, are you, what are you talking about, C.D. Andrews? I am, I am so confused. What is, disease, what is this disease called again? Are you talking about the cool season disease? Which disease are you talking about, C.D. Andrews? If you're talking about, uh, oh, you're talking about hell, Helminthosporium. Yeah, I put it in the chat. I put it in the chat. Uh, email me if you want the parts list. Uh, <laughs> Colonel Corn dropping the heat on Telly Coleman. <laughs> there we go. 
Hey, you know, that's one of the most exciting things about this show is that everybody can do a really good job of busting each other and uh, and getting along with it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, yeah, Hel Helmet the Sporum is, is what you're looking for. Uh, okay, I am running into the 50-minute mark, so I'm going to start winding this down. T winnings. I'm going to get out some plugs here. First and foremost to the Lawn Forum, thelawnforum.com. Um, those guys are big supporters of what I do, and I'm a very big supporter of what they do. Those guys are awesome. Um, everybody over there at thelawnforum.com really is next level, and the, the level of conversations that are going on over there are usually above and beyond what I see on – uh, our side is professional lawn care uh, applicator. So uh, really, really good stuff on the lawnforum.com. Uh, even if you are a professional, highly recommend you, you join because these guys teach me a lot day in and day out. How about a follow-up video on that house you did the nail drag reno on? Uh, yeah, I, I know. I need to go by there uh, and, and do it. It's, it's just kind of an odd position for me. It's hard for me to get by there a lot. Um, uh, next time Jeremy's over there, I'll see if he can take pictures of it. Uh, or if I get some free time, I'll just swing by and record a video on it. Rob Hawkins, yes, SOP for uh, potassium. Potassium sulfate is pH neutral. It's relatively low salt index. And it's very efficient, and it's also, it also provides a source of sulfate, SO4, which is plant available at the time of application. Also, it's going to release... Uh, a significant amount of oxygen at the soil surface, which is going to lead to a gravitational effect of the soil microbiology moving towards it, which in turn is going to do wonderful things for your soil and breaking down things like that. Uh, is humic 12 the fastest way to get humic acids into the soil? Yes, high rates of humic 12 would be that. Um, how about the draft? Been listening the whole time. Thanks, man. And what's up, Caesar? How are you, sir? Uh, not for turf, unless you know what you're doing. ATS is hot. Um, oh, okay, that's back to the ammonium thiosulfate. Burn a tree you put in last year. Figuring out here before trying it. All right, y'all. Thelawnforum.com. Check that out for the professional lawn care applicators. Check us out on Facebook, Professional Lawn Care Applicators of America. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about the Green County Fertilizer products, I think there's a little bit of uh, misinformation there um, that uh, I do not work for Green County Fertilizer. Uh, so if you have specifics about you know using the product in certain situations, I can give you the theory or the applied science behind it. But for first real world experience, you want to check out Lawncology on YouTube. That would also be John Perry. John Perry, the owner and manufacturer. Um, if you are looking for programs and all that fun stuff, be sure to check out my man Pete Denny or Alan Hain, the Lawn Care Nut, or GCI Turf. They do very much of that. Um, if you are wanting to just check out Kick-Ass Grass and how they made their grass kick ass, uh, I encourage you to watch uh, Connor Ward and John Ware, the Lawn Forum guys, Colonel Corn on YouTube where they have taken their lawns, not just low, but real low. And uh, they do all of that on the longform.com and on YouTube. So check it out. All right, y'all. I've got to finish up my cool season lawn video. This is it. That one's going to be really long. I'm having to outline it all on a, uh, on a, a, a word document. And uh, so far I'm already at like eight pages on it. And uh, I've recorded about 15 minutes of video. Um, so I, anyway, I've got a really, really long way to go on that one. Maybe I can get it out this week. Maybe it'll be the week after. I don't know. But in the meantime, I will be checking y'all out and updating you with what I see while I'm out in the field. Again, I thank all of y'all for, for tuning in and watching. If you haven't, please click the subscribe button. That's what lets me know to keep going. All right, y'all. Have a good one. Have a good week. Take it easy.